this guy was part of the groundation and the foundation. Now, here's the funny part about this guy. You got to think back in the what? Late, late 70s, uh, listening to music, uh, your favorite groups. And then this guy made a record and instrument. Now, at that time, nobody's thinking about somebody making an LP, a 33, an instrument. But this guy did, and he perfected it very well from the Bronx, talking about DXT. Yes, yes, yes. And we have Grammy award winning turntablist, audio engineer, producer. And I would say beat, beat maker, and I would say musician also, um, Grand Mixer DXT. So my, my first question for you today, we were kind of uh, in the room, we're talking about audio engineering and all that. How did you get into audio engineering? Because I'm an audio engineer myself. And how did you get into that? Um, it, it was just, the, it was just in, on the path, you know. And so as I was moving forward, uh, in my ambition to get into the music industry um, as a musician already. It was just something um, that was there in front of me and I, and I applied myself to it. Uh, I, I recorded my first record in, I think, 1981 or 82. Um, and I was in the studio. I, I had never been in a real recording studio before. And that was my first time. And um, once I got a good look at the technology that was in front of me I said you know I can I can do that you know I can learn it um I started with drum machines um and you know being in a, a, a music family coming from a musical background it was just the natural progression uh for me to apply myself to that aspect of, of the uh the genre or, or, or the culture of, of music yeah because i saw also you said in one interview that you took some of your older uh, recordings and you wanted to remix it redo it or remaster it i should say um what songs redux them. Redux. Yes. 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 yes what songs did you uh redux or redo uh i got cuts it up my the first record i, I, I ever i had ever done myself you know in a recording studio um of um, phase two, the Roxy, um, and a couple of songs that I never actually put out, um, upgrading those and, and putting them out. Gotcha, gotcha. Do you remember what console? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a gearhead myself. Uh, what console you did this stuff on, or kind of blurry? Oh, that's a good one. They may have been a Trident, an old Trident console. Uh, we did most of that stuff on a, a two-inch 16-track MCI machine. We even did Rocket on that machine. Right. It was a 16-track machine we originally did Rocket on. Right. Hey, D, can I, hey, D, can I ask you a question? Uh, does this sound familiar to you? 260 West 39th, 10018. 260 West 39th Street, 10018. 260. Not really, man. I, I can't. Sell, you gotta... sell your word records, man. Hey, man. I, <laughs> that's a long time ago. They was, a, they was at several places. Oh, how about that? How about that? Because that's when you did uh, cut it. That's when you did cut it up, right? Cuts it up. Um, oh, sell your word, correct? Say your Lloyd, yeah. Say your say your Lloyd, right on, right, right, right. right, right. Yeah, let me ask you, man. Uh, coming up with you, I mean, we really didn't tell the whole story. Cooley, can you please ask this guy how we first met, please, for crying out loud? So, how did the Rex Garvin and Grand Mixer, and I would say DST, uh, relationship come about? Well, we we were raised as cousins. Um, we were, uh, I'm thinking, I'm not sure if he was in school yet. Um, I think it was around right after kindergarten, first, mm -hmm. second grade, right around then. 
And uh, our mothers were both singers. And uh, we he, he came to one of our house parties and he spent the night. And the next day we went to 112 Park. They had this uh, outdoor pool kind of thing. And it was like it was like a cement pool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was he was just completely upset about being there. So, but that was it. Then we 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 were. Uh, that was it. We we were together from that that moment on. This uh, this is when I knew this guy was not well. Uh, his sister set up a tent like like we were outside camping. She set up a tent. Man, she was uh, Selena, very creative. And then I had I had D screaming when I said, "Man, somebody smell like soup." <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I said, "Somebody smells like soup." Right. <laughs> I mean, we we said I mean, as kids, man, he said second grade. We knew each other before second, man. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, with, it's man. a long time ago. We 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 were raised we were raised together. So it's it's you know his wow. mother and father's my uncle and aunt. That's how we were raised. Uncle Rex and Aunt Audrey. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so y'all it's, it's probably it's probably before before that. I just it's just so long ago. But you know what? I'm gonna tell you when my mother used to go get him, him and his mom, over in the Bronx, over in Edenwall, and bring him back to Mount Vernon. And there, there was no, there was no DST, there was no DXT. We were just kids, man. You know, there was no cold funk, there was no Rex. We were just kids. But what was so deep about being a child back then? was the, uh, and this is deep cool. Look, I'm gonna give you some deep, this, I mean, you know, for everybody that's listening, this is very heavy. But we're talking about music. Music is very powerful. Can you imagine being a kid in the 70s, late 60s, late 60s, right? Check this yeah. out, cool. Check this out before, before, now, cause see, DXT is really a musician. So I can talk to, let's not even talk about rap and hip hop right now. Let's talk about being a musician, which is very important. Can you imagine coming up in a time as a kid, Kulik, around instruments, guitars, drums, violins? There's nothing to compare it to. All you have is instruments, uh, an xylophone, sax, oboes. And check this out. When me and Dee was coming up, they had music classes. See, they don't have that in schools no more, but you have actual instruments, right. no computer. So what happens when there's no computer, all you have is your hands and your mind. And you you know, so you have to use your God-given talent. You have to use your hands, okay? You can't press a button. See, D presses the button by choice, but without the computer, he's a musician. A lot of people can't say that, see? Everybody tell me I'm a musician, but they press a goddamn button. Right. And that's the problem with the industry. There's so many button pushers calling themselves musicians. And there's very few people that can play an actual instrument. Can you imagine coming up a time of a Sly and the Family Stone, James Brown, Stevie Wonder, BT Express, uh, Funkadelic? George Clinton was real deep. And I'm going to tell you something, man. Der D, DXT, this guy is from the projects. He's from the real deal. And let me tell you something about the projects before Gangster Rap destroyed it. The projects used to be a great place to go to. That's where the creativity was at. You never know who was there, man, playing different kinds of music. You know what's so deep about the projects? You had have, you have brothers there playing a two-record set, playing meditation music, and just finished killing somebody, but they went inside and played some beautiful music. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they had violins. After they annihilated somebody, they playing harps and violins and shit. But, right. that, but that tells you about music and instruments and instruments. And man, the projects, man, you had police officers that lived there, the postmen, everybody lived there. So it wasn't about the hood. That's where they lived. But so much beauty came from it. And right. DXT came from that fantastic environment. So he came from the projects to Mount Vernon, because Mount Vernon is the heights. 
That's like, you know, that, that's the heights. You know, and so he had two dimensions of music. He had the project, then he came to Mount Vernon and had a whole nother, in Scarsdale, he had a whole nother world of music, man. Uh, Earth and, 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 and his DXT's inspiration mentally is Earth, Wind and Fire and Stevie Wonder. I hmm. mean, when this guy, when, when I, I saw this guy have an out-of-body experience, there was an album called Spirit, one of the greatest albums ever. I seen this guy float above the house. <laughs> this guy's floating. He's floating. This guy's butt naked, eat, eating applesauce, and, <laughs> and floating, listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Maurice White is an element. Right. People don't understand Maurice White, man, in the 70s for kids. Oh my God. Another dimension. Another dimension. And the Isley brothers, too. Yep. Right. Deep, deep groups, man, had an impact. Deep groups. Yes. And, that, and, that, and, and even with D, because of that experience, he's able to work with Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones. D's done a lot of work, man. He's, a, he's done a lot of white groups. See, people don't realize he's done a lot of white groups, too. I mean, legends, icons. And right. that's the power of music, coming up in music. When you come up with that kind of music, you can work with anybody. Right. That's that's right. I I, I can, as you would know, Rex. I, I play guitar. I play drums, and I, I look at I, your back. Look look at your albums in the back. Very impressive. You got the Ozzy Brothers, the Police. Very yeah. impressive. Pat Benatar. Yeah. You got it going on, bro. Yes, yes. Because I, I I that's the background I came from. You know, it was like if you can't play an element or an instrument, you really cannot call yourself a producer, a drummer, whatever. I mean, I'm not dogging out the. Um, uh, 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 mouse clickers, if you will. But you know, if I didn't know how to play drums, or guitar, me using this drum machine I have here, you know, I'll, I'll put it in the camera. Um, I wouldn't know really what to do on it because I have the bass and set of skills that I can apply to this, and it made me a better beat maker or, or, or a producer too. So I just understand it, under, understood the whole picture. Um, so DXT, I know that you're a drummer. What, what, what? caught your ear and eye to become a drummer and who are some of your favorite drummers again um when you learn how to walk for the first time and you walk down the hallway um you 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 don't know until you have a better understanding that your parents helped you to learn to do that that's something that they give you the ability to use your legs and reach out to you and you reach out for them. And just in the, the natural process of doing that, you get your balance and you walk. Well, in our families, they did the same thing with instruments. They would just put them there, mm -hmm. you know? And so I get up one morning and there's a drum set there, you know, and there's a guitar there. And so I picked up the sticks. My brother picked up the guitar. Wow. And so it's, it's not what, what made me do it was my mother. She put it there. And her love for music. You know, and uh, my grandma, who instilled it in her daughter, my mother. You know. That's deep though. You no, know, we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago, Cool. Remember, we were talking about in black culture. Right. How, no matter what house you went to, there was either some drums, kungas, or a piano there. Right. In black culture, black people always had a piano. Even if they couldn't play it, there was always a piano. There was always some kind of instrument. And my mother, man, my mother was like, oh my God, guitars, my father, keyboards, my mom was just a maraca, tambourines. My mother is a a a, vers a versioso when it comes to just instruments. Right. Her singing, her her mouth is an instrument. Uh, the you know, the way she talks is all instrumental, and she loves and she and she loves the music and to come up around her and my her to come up around her and my father. I had no choice but to be a victim of the music. I mean, I was trapped right. along with along with me along with me me being mentally retarded because I love Jerry Lewis and I love Bugs Bunny. No, I'm done. I'm, I'm really a nutcase. So music really gave me a balance. It right. gave me a balance because uh, without music and just pure comedy, I would have been in the insane asylum with a straight jacket. <laughs> right, right, right. So music, stop laughing, cool it, please. Uh, music was really, uh, music is deep. Uh, 
like I tell young people, if you know how to embrace the music and love the music, the music will love you back. You know, I mean, you 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 totally get what you give. Totally. Right, 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 right. right. Um, so DXT, can you explain what is the meaning? Because this is my question. You were there, and so was Rex, but you were there at the beginning of this so-called hip hop or bebop and stuff like that. Where did these terms come from? How do they come about? Preach, go ahead, D preach. Um the the term hip hop, most people are gonna be very surprised to know to learn this, but it was originally a pejorative term, meaning it was a negative term. And it was used to insult the b-boys, the dancers. You know, the, the, the main part of the story of the hip hop culture is a, it's a b-boy story. Um, it, it's the experience of the dancer. Um, everything else came together uh, based on the, ne the necessity to hear the music in the right environment so that you can dance. Um, the older generation would refer to the dances and the moves that we would do. They would, they would insult us by saying, man, get out of here with that hippity hoppity BS. You know, they would actually use words that I, I choose not to use today. Um, and so we saw that term as an insult and a negative. What, what happened was two people, uh, Lovebug Starsky and Keith Cowboy of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, they began to use the term in their rhymes, which uh, through the repetitiveness of it, uh, popularized it and turned it from a pejorative to a positive term terminology used within the culture. But originally, uh, hip hop was not a good uh, term used uh, because it was directed at the dancers negatively. Um, as far as bebop, bebop predates hip hop uh, by generations. The, the truth of the matter is, is that even what we're doing, what we're calling hip hop, it's, it's not new. It didn't start in the 70s. We reconnected to that energy in the 70s. Um, you know, the dance is part of our genetic makeup. It's what we do, uh, generation after generation. Uh, expressing ourselves verbally is what we do, generation after generation, uh, there's, there was a glitch in our matrix when um, we were um, tortured and beaten into changing our language to a European language, which takes us out of our, uh, out of the frequency of our genetic makeup ver orally, um, but we still manage to uh, connect to uh, synchronize ourselves to to the vibratory system of the planet and our sun. Um, it, you know, it, it, we can go really deep into that because I've been really doing research on just that subject matter alone. But to 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 simplify it, you know, the origins of our genetic makeup is still the or is still the origins of our genetic makeup. So we are still connected to. Uh, our ancestors. We are just the, the latest model of our ancestors. And so that the expressions and the things that they did to connect them and synchronize them to this planet is still in us. Wow. If you want to go deeper into that, I, I, this is definitely a platform to do it because I'm, I'm learning uh, also too. I'm always going to be a student, just like Rex said. Um, we were talking about um, uh, about a week ago, I think we were talking about that, Rex. But if you would like to go deeper, you, you can do so also, because uh, I'm 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 learning history, and uh, this is this is this is great. So I don't know if you want to expound on that more. Oh, definitely. But let me explain. Oh, and for those who don't see me, I'm I'm having video uh, technical difficulties. But you know what I look like, and um, you know, you see me next time, whatever the case. 
But as long as you see my man, uh, Grand Mixer, that's the main thing because there's so much history there. Um, you know, I used to hang with D, uh, and we're going to get more into that later on, like shortly. When he was doing his thing, I got a little nervous when I would go to the uh, record companies with him. Here's when I got nervous because see, I'm a soul brother. Um, my mother, man, oh man, played a major role in my life. I didn't know that until I got older because she had clubs in the South. She had nightclubs and she was, in, and D, D will tell you about that in a minute too. She was a, a performer in the South, you know, Sunday in full speed. And man, my mom's a rock star, man. She She's the reason why I like rock. I like rock. When I saw my mom into white groups, it freaked me out because I call my mom like a chocolate hippie because she's black, but she's like a we are the real type soul sister. And she has, she got her black friends and she got her Jewish friends. So, and Jimi Hendrix came to the house. Nobody knows that. Wow. Teddy, Teddy Pendergrass from the Blue Notes, Joe Frazier when he was heavyweight champion. So, uh, Rod Perry, uh, my uh my cousin man uh cousin in law who was in SWAT uh you know there's so much and so and D would come to that and he was he was in fantasy land and his fantasy land became a reality and because he already I mean listen to the way he talks I mean you know he's a scientist you know this guy man he, he's a, he's at professor level that's why you know when he's started out as DST Delancey Street, he was finding himself. See, D, D, D is a loner. He, he, hangs with, he, he hangs with a lot of people, but he's really by himself. Because I'm the same way. We are around a lot of people, but we really into our own solitude. The danger with me and him, when me and him, with me and him are together, it can be very haunting and scary for other people. Because in the house of drama, me and him will look at each other and we start falling out laughing and people go, what the hell y'all laughing about? And we never tell them. And that scares people. <laughs> that, that scares people, man. And it's all about, and I say that because there's music in there that you're finding your music. Um, who knew in these personal time he would take himself where he took it? He took himself somewhere else. And that's heavy because he got lost in the music. I saw I saw this guy have an out-of-body experience. I'm going to tell y'all, listen to Earth, Wind & Fire's album, Spirit. Uh, the first song on there is Get Away. That's the Get Away. One of the greatest albums ever. And Maurice White and the crew are on there doing meditation. They like standing in, on a meditation level. And can you imagine being 12, 13, 14 years old and that's coming out? Come on, man. And D found himself in that. And by my mother and father being musicians, and my, I'm going to the studio with my dad, Herb Abison downtown, the founder of Atlantic Records. I'm hanging with my dad going downtown. He's taking me everywhere with him. And I don't know that because I'm so used to it. But when I got older, I said, oh my God, look at my life because we're busy being ourselves. D's been around the world. He don't act like it. He's a simple dude. He's been every damn where. You know why it's simple? Because this is what we do. And at the same time, who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Um, a lot of people don't know about D. The only thing you can tell some people, they go, you ever heard that song, Rock and Herbie Hancock? Yeah, yeah. But he's done so much other stuff, but that's the hook. And just think, he got Herbie Hancock. Was that his? Was that his first Grammy? D. Yes. Thank you. Thank first you. and second. First, okay. This man from Edenwall Projects, baby, boy, got Herbie a jazz icon, Miles Davis, Art Blakely. Oh um, man, I mean, this man, the uh, Chick Corea, the late great, fantastic Chick Corea, just left. Man, part of, part of that crew. Right. And for him to get involved in some a guy that scratches records and get a Grammy? What? On the first time going to LA? D finish that story up, bro. When you went to L <laughs> after when you when, when uh on you know, but her Herbie, talk about you and Herbie, talk about all that, bro. Well, it was uh 
it was a, a chapter of you know education. It was a it was a, a very educational experience because you know to you know one day you you DJing in the hood you know and the next thing you know you are performing on a record with one of the greatest musicians in our time. And, you know, you don't know where it's going, but, you know, you, 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 you've been asked to, part, to participate in it. And to the point where the trust was based on my ability. And so they trusted me based on what they saw me do. And so they let me bring my own two cents to that album, you know. And, uh, you know, the rest pretty much speaks for itself. It worked out. You know, I, I I put on there what I thought would work, and it worked. Hey, hey um, Dean, let me ask you this. Did, uh, did Bill Laswell bring you in, or did you meet Bill after that? No, I met I met Bill when they were putting together the whole Celluloid Records. And Herbie, the project was one of the projects that came up. Uh, Bill brought it to my attention that um, Herbie's manager was looking for some demos uh, for a new sound for Herbie. And um, he, he, you know, he asked me if I was interested in, in participating in coming up with some new stuff for Herbie. And I was, I was in, you know. But you know what, D? Hey, but D, let me say this, bro. To speak about Herbie. Uh, hey, Sonia, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? All right. Yeah, to speak about Herbie, uh, D, you got to think as kids, what was the, okay, D, this thing, let's go back now. Me and you are twins when it come to this. As a kid, what was your, how do you remember Herbie as a kid for you? I was a huge fan. You know, we, we was, used to speak What was the song for you? Um, a few. I mean, Chameleon was the Chameleon, main, Chameleon, Chameleon. That was the main song. Chame that was, was the main Chameleon. song. Yeah. Yes, sir. But, um, but you I know what, D? Seeing him, let me, let hey, me just D, say check this. this out. Let hey, me just D. say this. Let me say this. Hold up. Mm. We 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 um watched him on Don Kirshner's rock concert. And um I think it was the Manchild album. Yes. He was performing. And he did this thing with the synthesizer where he made it breathe on its own. And uh, you know, we were mesmerized by that. And uh, the next day, me and uh, Carter, one of my my close friends. We were talking about it, and I told him that day, you know, that one day I would play with Herbie, and 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 it actually happened. It's just an, an amazing story because I actually said that. You know what, D? I'm gonna tell you. Here's what here's what did it for me with Herbie. In right. nineteen in 1979, he made a song called "Feet Don't Fail Me Now." Right. Uh, remember that album? Yeah. And that's when I knew Herbie was different. Because he did, it was kind of like a jazz funk kind of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. you could play that at the club and get your groove on. So when he got you for Rocket, it all made sense for me. I mean, as I thought about it, it all made sense. So when you did what you did with him, it was like being home for you, huh? Yeah, it was. It was a. Uh, it was very comfortable um, working with with Herbie. Um, it's, it's interesting because it, it's, you know, he, um, whenever I would work with him, he, whatever I would do, you know, he was like, hey man, is this, this, is your, this is your moment. You know, this is about what you can do. You know, we trust you, you you're a creative guy. And, uh, you know, and so we, we're, we're, we're taking it, we're taking information from wherever, where, however you can come up with it, we're listening. You know, it wasn't like uh, you're a new guy, stay over there and wait until we tell you. They were like, no, whatever ideas you have, bring to the table. So when, so, okay, so with that kind, okay, so let's go. Now you, you got the song, the video was out, the video, but they don't show you. They show the right. robots. Right. And they, Herbie's in like a, like three seconds of it. And, you know, that was the bittersweet part of it because we were still dealing with um, institutionalized racism in the music industry. And so Rocket 
video is basically a 21st century race record. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, because they would not play it on MTV. Yeah, because, it, it, Michael Jackson had a hard time. Well, what got Rocket played was one, there, there were no black people in it. Um, there were white robots, white mannequins and stuff. And right. uh, two, uh, the president of, of uh, Sony threatened to pull all of, the, all of the artists if they didn't play Michael Jackson. So that opened the door for, um, you know, a uh, black artist to, you know, get an opportunity to be on a music television. And just think about how insane that is and how that, you know, impacted American culture negatively, you know, to this day, that these, this type of behavior and how it affects everyone, mm. you know, it's just, you know, and I actually got into a, a, a little back and forth with the owner of MTV because I had I had made a comment about this in another interview I did. And it was, a, a, you know, and, and no disrespect to him at all, you know, because it, at the end of the day, when, when M MTV finally realized that, you know, human beings are human beings and talent is talent. And, you know, if you close your eyes and listen to a great song, you're listening to a great song. Um, yo, MTV raps um, help to, you know, bring rap to the world. Right. So, you know, they eventually came around, but, you know, the process of that is, is just, it's horrible, you know, and it, and it exists still to this day in, in many ways that people see it, but don't want to see it, you know. But you know what, though? I'm going to tell you something, bro. I, I got to say this. One thing I can say about what, uh, what rap has done, mm -hmm. slash hip hop, slash hip hop, uh, you had your funk bands, you know, you had the Ohio Players, you had BT Express, Earthman and Fire. Mm -hmm. You know, those those groups, those fun, who are like really sadly forgotten. I mean, we hear the sample, we're familiar with the flashback, but the artistry of these people are totally forgotten about. Case in point, Sugarfoot, Ohio players. Uh, right. Well, I had the I had the 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 um, honor of getting on stage, standing on stage with Sugar and actually performing with him. He was on the third album we produced for Herbie. And Sugar Sugar was on that album. Was that Vibe Alive? Vibe Alive, yeah. That's a bad and, cut. And so I, I, one of my heroes, Sugarfoot, I got the opportunity to actually work with him on that album and perform with him on stage on the road. Let me ask you a question, man. And, and please, as an old school soul brother, man, from the bottom of your heart, when yes, you was sir. on stage, when you when you was on stage with Sugarfoot, did you have an out of body experience, man? Well, I was telling him that I'm changing the name of the band from the Rocket Band to the Ohio Players Part Two, so <laughs> he, he got a kick out of that. And uh, it was just awesome. It was just an awesome experience to be on stage with one of the people you watched and who nurtured you through recordings uh, to be um, a performance artist. I met I met him in California, man. He he, he was wearing flip flops. And his toes was hanging over the flip flops, man. <laughs> he was, he can, and, and he would walk around with a whip. He had, a, he would walk around with a whip, man. Sugarfoot was deep. He was a real he, Sugarfoot was a real funk rock star. I met him in Vallejo. I did a show with him in Vallejo. I MC the show. I got pictures of us too with a bunch of uh, Filipino honeys, and they were in a U-Haul. They were around the country, and he was very. He was very angry at Satch. He was very angry at Satch, man, because Satch took all the money. Yeah, I know the story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we had talks, man. Me and Sugarfoot. I, he, he's, he's deep, man. He, he, he would drink, a, he'd get a whole bottle of Cavassier, or he'd fill it to the top and drink and talk to you. <laughs> Sugarfoot, he was bad. That, hey, man, ow. Me, me and Dean would be in the living room. And we'd be tripping on Sugarfoot because Sugarfoot go, chow, and me and D go, children. <laughs> <laughs>
Ow! How much how? Ow! Hey, 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 listen, I was with Sugar in Boston mm. and we were on the we were on the opposite side, the outside of Wrigley Field. And right outside of Wrigley Field in in um there's a street behind the, the, the monster wall. Mm. And there's pawn shops there. Not porn, pawn shops. Right. Okay? And we were walking by and he stopped and he was staring in the window at this guitar. And I went, you know, I'm looking, I'm like, what you looking at? He says, man, that looks like my guitar. Whoa. I said, yo, it does look like your guitar. You know, it was the double neck was it, it was a double neck? Yeah, he said, no, D, that, that looks like my guitar. Wow. And it was his guitar. Somebody had stole it. He saw and, his um, guitar in the window, dude. He saw his guitar in the window in the pawn shop. And, and you were there, and you were there to witness that with him? I was standing there with him, yeah. Wow. Mind blow. Mind blow. Yeah, I was like, wow. And so I went inside and I said, you know, this is guitar belongs to this. So he's like, dude, so we we purchased it from somebody. So that's, you know. And this was in Boston. This was in Boston. In Boston, he was like, "Well, if he can produce and prove it and come with his paper, but he didn't have none of that stuff. It was long gone." No, but hold and, on, bro. But but how long was he in Boston for the guitar to be missing like that? This was, I mean, somebody had stole it years ago. Oh. And you're happy to see while you're walking by the dog. On walking park. by, and he stopped and he said, "Hey, man, that looks like my guitar." And I said, it does, you know, thinking that it's the double neck joint. He the said, no, neck, dude. he said, no, that looks like my guitar, you know? And I was like, wow, wow. That, that was heartbreaking to see that, you know, cause he was did done, it, he was, he was done the for the rest I mean, did you get to get, how much did it, how much did it cost? The dude, once we said that, you automatically know what the guy did. He was like, you went and took it out the window and everything, man, it was crazy. So did he get the guitar? The guy said it. He got to come back with the paperwork and stuff to prove it was. And Sugarfoot didn't have it. No, that was years ago. Somebody stole it. No, but, but I'm saying, but so he he did he just couldn't. Oh, he wasn't. Once that happened, the dude wasn't even going to sell it. Wow, that was the mistake. That was the mistake that 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 we made saying that to him. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and DXT, also I know for Rocket, you did that in one take. And when, when I listen to your uh, when I listen to your records, I hear tightness. Your cues, your scratches are very quantized or tight. Is that because you're a drummer? You know, that's my that's my drum skills. You know, um, I I started to shed with the turntables the same way I play drums. And so, you know, you know, this is this is still my snare hand, you know, my my left hand, and this is my cymbal ride hi hat and all of that. And so I already had the muscle memory. I'm well into several thousands of hours of of doing those kind of uh, exercises and shedding. And so I just applied it to turntables. Yeah. Um, and also I appreciate there's there's a performance you did. I don't know what year and date it was, but it was something for Newmark. And there were some technical difficulties, not on your end. Something happened. But what I liked is you kept your composure. You went through the performance and you still, you know, in other words, you didn't let that phase you. As an artist, as a performer, how do you? Oh, yeah, it's the turntables. Uh, again, I, I, I always notice and I don't want to point at any fingers or anything like that. But there's always something wrong when I'm the last person to get on the turntables. There always seems to be something changed on them that <laughs> you know the balance the all needle, of a sudden all is all of a sudden stuff always happens man and so um but i'm a, i'm a performance artist you know i spent my whole life on stage so the show must go on if i if i had to scat i would have done that you know what i'm saying right right and so i just made it work I just did. I just did what I just adjusted to the touch because there was a touch touch issue. You know, my normal touch was creating a, a, a balance problem with the tone arm. And so I had to readjust. 
Well, wow. talk about, okay, now talk about a normal touch. Let's talk now. Let's talk. Let's touch this. Okay, you win the Grammy. You yes, win sir. the Grammy. What level is that? I mean, who's in the audience, D? Please talk to us, please. Who's in the audience? Okay, hold on. Let's, okay, before you get to the ceremony, how are you feeling knowing that you're nominated for Rocket? Now you're nominated for a Grammy. Good grief. How do you feel? What's going on in your mind? It was a weird day. It was the same day Michael Jackson caught on fire and went running around the theater, burning up. Wow. That's um, when he got, really? That's when they got nominated during that time? Same, the same day, we got the newspaper with Michael Jackson on the cover with a thumbs up on the stretcher. Wow. Mummified. And while we're reading that, the, uh, the manager came in and said, oh, not for nothing, while y'all sobbing about that, y'all just got nominated for a Grammy. So, um, oh no disrespect to Michael Jackson, but that that became old news, right? And and um, so we were celebrating. We had a concert that night. That's also the night that Herbie coined the phrase "turntablist." So, can we talk about that? What is the difference between turntablist and DJ? Well, according to Herbie, because I I didn't like the term turntablist. I, I'm a DJ. That's the way I saw it, you know, and 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 that's that's my way of of uh, of being a purist to that culture. And so here comes this new nomenclature thing happening, turn you know to turn to changing the the dialogue. Um, and um, he said, you know, D, listen, I'm a pianist, and I'm a virtuoso pianist. Wayne is a bassist. And he can play, he can improvise and solo and all of that. And you can actually do the same thing with the turntable. We watch you do it. Hence, I'm a pianist, he's a bassist, you're a turntablist. And you didn't like that? No, nah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't how, like it. How do you feel about it now? Well, I mean, it is what it is, you know, um, but the difference is, is, and I appreciate it because you clearly see the difference. You know, there's guys who are great scratchers, you know, and DJs who can scratch, but if you put them on the stage as part of a musical ensemble, it's, it's not going to work. Okay, but D, but you know what, in my opinion, on the, on the outside looking in, Herbie Hancock gave you a fantastic anointing and a compliment for oh this, absolutely i mean i, I was too no, young to to process no, let, me, let me let me finish this no, you said you said that you didn't like it so let, so let, let me piggyback on that um, veggie back bro no pork you let, let me cow back let me cow back on that my friend all right veggie, let me veggie cow back. back you are a, you are a hoot um by him being a jazz artist he gave you the ultimate compliment because you're not playing an instrument. You are a turntablist. I think that's a one. And even though you're a DJ in your world and you're fantastic and you're a scientist at it and a professor, but turntablist for the jazz archives, definitely, it fits. No, I, I understand it. I, I get it. You know, mm -hmm. when once when he explained it that way, right, it made sense because right. it, it it defines what I was doing, and it's right. it's not. It's not DJing. I didn't stand up there and play records all night. You know, I'm playing the turntable. And I actually did not even refer to what I do as using the turntable. I, I called it a turn fiddle because mm. that was that was my mental approach to it. Go ahead. Uh, or, or, or either that or, or, or a guica, you know. And so um, that's how I was thinking. And then from, from the musicality side, I was thinking of Ella and, and Miles and, and Train and, you know, in, improvisation. You was thinking about stuff like that when you were doing your thing? My approach to it, you know, I'm, I'm scatting through it. You know, I'm thinking of these things. So, but that's, what, that's where your head was at at the time on that level, thinking about stuff like that? I, yeah, when, you know, just from the record collection that we grew right, up right. with, I, I was using, you know, Miriam Makiba. Okay. You know, uh, this, is, this is what we grew up listening to. So that's right. I applied those you know, those uh, experiences and, and that vast, um, um, you know, uh, catalog of, um, 
music that our parents had as as the best references that one can have to um you know move forward with their understanding of musicianship hey cool let me tell you something about this guy okay me and him at the same time okay now i'm, I'm gonna come out the closet this is real because this, this you're talking to two bibles we're both bibles right to what we are into this guy can pick up a, he can pick up an lp an album cover like the album covers you have in the back cooler right he'll look at the album in a in a in a trance state he, he goes into a trance it's like it's like holding a little baby and i'm serious there's something powerful and, and you see what he, he had a cassette i got cassettes and albums too like i said next time you see me i'm gonna have all my stuff but uh, to everybody that's want to know where I'm at, I'm having video difficulties, but as long as you can hear my voice. Right. Um, but this guy is really, in real life, brother, he is the album, he's the cassette, he's the LP, he's the realistic 45. That's the record right there, brother. That, that guy is a record. And that's why turntable is, I, man, I, I'm, I'm going to get me a t-shirt with that. that. That really works. I like that. It really makes sense on who this guy is. Because you figure from DST to, from DST to DXT, that's different levels, right? And don't tell them where this guy's going to go, with what you know was what he went to. Also, too, hey D, can you tell people about Michael Jackson when you met Michael Jackson and the compliment he gave you after you won the Grammy? Well, we was backstage, you know, in the green room, and um, he came in there and he was shocked. You know, he was like. He was blown away by the performance. And he said, I mean, everybody was. And he, and he said, man, you, you guys had us all full. We thought those were robots, you know, from because of the video. So they're thinking everything up there is robot. And when the, the dancers jumped up and started break dancing, they were blown away. And he said, man, that was awesome. He said, that's the first time I was ever at the Grammys. And, and it was a standing ovation for a performance. Hey, man. Did it blow your mind how tall? Can you tell people how yeah, tall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was shocked at how tall he was. You know, that's I, a mind blow. A, Michael Jackson late. that tall? Yeah, I did not realize he was he was that tall. I mean, that's to deep. me, I because I was a late bloomer as far as growing, and um, he just appeared to be very tall to me. I was like, wow. Well, he's he what? Must have a strong presence, on D. I mean, you know, it, he didn't have a bunch of bodyguards around him because we were in the green room and he saw us as his equals you know we just won a grammy so we're, no, we're but, his, but, but his presence being that tall he's yeah, his, I mean, yeah his presence was 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 i mean i mean i'm a huge fan I, I knew him my whole life and the first time i'm meeting this man who you know was one of the people that all of the alpha males that was into talent wanted to be like at one time you know Nobody wanted to be Tito. So, you know, here's the here's the guy. You right. know, no dis, no disrespect to Tito, but that's what it was. Can we talk about cuz this this was amazing. I mean, everything is amazing to me, but this is more of my um uh, if you will, generation, I have to go back and look into that kind of stuff or what my parents taught me or, or what, you know, Rex and yourself DXT are, are teaching me, but I do know it, but it wasn't my era. Uh, you did the music for episode one uh, for the Defiant ones. And, and a lot of my favorite producers are Dr. Dre and, and my favorite producer and idol is DJ Quick. Can you talk about how that came about? What was the process? What was the techniques? I know you're doing master classes on that also, but uh, can yeah. you talk about that whole thing, please? Well, um, a close friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Love, uh, works with Alan Hughes the director of um, Menace to Society and Book of Eli. He's a close friend of his and he works with him. And so Alan Hughes was directing the Dr. Dre, Jimmy Iovine story on HBO. Mm -hmm. And apparently they was going through a bunch of producers for a particular segment that they, they was not happy or it just wasn't working out. Uh, when they were putting the or you know music to film in this particular section, and so <clears throat> he called me and he said, "Hey man, we're working on this 
thing for HBO is Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine, you know, and it, it doesn't get big, bigger than that, doesn't get higher than that. So I'm like, okay, so what, what do you need? And he said, man, they're having an issue with this section. And I told him that I know somebody that can do it with no problem. He can do it. Like, you know, so I wasn't the first person they thought of, you know. And so he said, D, I, I told him that uh, I got somebody that could do it. And I know you can do it. So I'm going to send you the, the, the footage. You know, I'll send you the daily. Look at it. And uh, I said, well, when, when do you need it? It's 1130. <laughs> I need it at 12 o'clock midnight. That's how much time I had, but not literally. I had about, you know, a week or so, right. you know, to, to, to score this whole section mm. of the film, wow. you know, and I, it was like two, almost three minutes. And, you know, in film, that's, that's, that's serious, you right. know? Right. Yeah. And so um, I spent a week just staring at it. I just looked at it in silence. I had it looping every day, all day. I just let it loop. And then eventually certain things started coming to me. Sounds, ideas, gimmicks. There was turntable stuff in that section. And um, I came up with something that, that blew them away. You know, it, it, I was trying to be really clever about it. And I used their dialogue. I sampled them and scratched them back in to within their dialogue. So they would end up on time with what they're saying. And then I took uh, like easy E section because uh, Alan Hughes called me and he, he, you know, he didn't really know who I was. His son said, man, do you understand who that guy is? Like, He's one of the guys, you know? Right. So he, he said, oh, well, I'm really hearing, um, the Jacksons, can you feel it? And um, he said, the, the section where Michael says, all the children in the world, he said, I want, I see uh, the little kid on the bike throwing his arms up in that. He said, I'm seeing that. And like, he's a, he's a director. He's a big, he's one of the top Hollywood directors. And so I'm sitting there listening to him. I'm gonna get, I said, okay, I'm gonna call you when I have something. So I went and took it. And I took that section and I, I kept offsetting it until that section of the song happened when the boy threw his arms up in the air. And then, he, so he called me and I said, listen to this. And then for him, he's saying, let me see it because he's a director, so he's talking like that. But he's really listening, but he's seeing it while he's listening. And when that part happened, he was, he, he kind of freaked out, you know? And he said, thank you, man, that's it. I, I, I'm gonna get you the master, we're gonna get you the master to uh, can you feel it from the, the family? I was like, well, they can probably do that, you know? Right, right. It, but uh, hey, then man, again, hey, we're, talk, hey. we're talking about Joe Jackson, so it's not likely that that's hey, gonna hey, happen. Hey, man, <laughs> Who in the hell do you think you are to be that damn intelligent? What are you saying? Man? Who do you think you are to be that I mean, you, you, I don't like you. You're a damn scientist. <laughs> You're a fucking genius. What the hell's going on here? Yeah. I mean, you're a scientific fucking genius. Well, you know, I, I, mean, because, I like you said, you I created a talk. song. Hmm. I created a song called Freak Patrol because that was one of the, that was the name of uh, Dr. Dre's dance group. Mm -hmm. So I actually said, you know what? I'm going to make a song from that time period because they showed them locking. Right. So I, I created a song based on the name of their group. And I made it sound like, you know, craft work and, and stuff like that. So it, it turned out to be fun. Um, uh, Alan, you know, he texted me, he emailed me and said, hey, man, you killed it. Love, love, love. Uh, the wow. producer, uh, uh, um, uh, Doug Prey, uh, mm -hmm. called me. They, they all loved it. And then, you know, I'm sitting there. Forgot, you know, job is done. I went on with my life. And next thing I know, I get a, I get a text, congratulations. And I'm like, what happened? And then Rhonda called me, we won. And it won a Grammy. Right, that's right. So, yeah, I'm like, oh, snap, okay. And then Doug called me, everybody's congratulating each other. And so I was one of the contributors for that Grammy. And, and I was like, hey, I'll take it. So you, you know? on your second Grammy dog. That's uh, third. Third? 
Yeah, hey, man, and also uh, we they just don't, won. They don't need me to talk to you no more. I mean, shit. I'm, hey, we, I, I, I got to go work at Wendy's tonight. <laughs> this some bullshit. Don't be laughing. I, I'm all embarrassed and shit. Thank, thank God y'all can't see me. I got, I, I got on my fucking KFC outfit and shit. <laughs> I got chi- I got chicken around my mouth. <laughs> yeah, we just won um the album of the year for wow. the J- Japanese version of the Grammys for the Palo Alto album. I just uh-huh. did in October, Thelonious Monk mm. in Palo Alto, California. Uh we just won that. And so it's going into the 2022 Grammys and it's it's a high prospect uh for album of the year, jazz album of the re- of the year. Nice. That will be that will be my fourth if if that happens but you know i don't even think about stuff like that and i don't even think about it but my 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 you know people around me it it, it means a lot you know right. and right. and so i get into the conversation you know well you ain't got well you really don't have time to be into that because you you have to you know one thing about doing what you're doing you always have to work on the next project your mind is right. working on the next project you're not thinking about what's out. What like people outside are freaking out. Hey man, man, but that's what you do, you know. Right. And, I have I have a um huge project mm-hmm. that I'm about to do now. A couple huge projects. Um, I'm working on a a, a project with uh, Universal mm-hmm. Records, and uh, I actually I'm going to start on the album with the Last Poets. Um, uh, very soon. Uh, I'm uh producing an album right now called the the journey with uh t.s monk the son of Thelonious monk and uh I, next week hopefully if the schedule is right i start on uh, angie stone uh, uh one one piece with her for this project i, I recorded allison williams um t.s monk uh i'm gonna get dougie fresh on this record it's gonna be a great project and a bunch of great poets but uh, the and last poets are also on that. I recorded uh, four pieces with them already for this project called the the journey, um, and it's 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 going good. I mean, the, the COVID thing have has stifled us somewhat, you know, because everybody spread up spread out around the country. But um, I'm really excited about re- uh, working with the last poets again, and producing producing their album. Yes, yes. I think Rex is having uh, technical difficulties again. So Rex, come back in the room. Um, so the music that you sent um, uh, for the Defiant ones, did you, I, I know you're an audio engineer. Did you have like a, did you give them a mixed reference or did they redo it? How, how did they go about? Well, of course, you know, it, it did, the, the final mix of what they did with it is totally different from what I did. Got it. Uh, but it's, that's the job. You know, you do what you do. And the director and his sound people have their own vision. And so it, it, it ended up the way they did it. I sent them stems. That's what they asked for. I did a mix. I sent them my mix. And I also sent them stems. And their music people basically did with whatever they had to do with it. Right, 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 right. Because that <clears throat> that whole process of the defiant or defiant ones was great i mean and i found out you did it i was like wow especially the first episode the first episode is amazing but um mm-hmm. uh, i was like wow dxt did that too um and then you telling how you came about or in other words how you uh came up with the music and looking at the scenes and kind of going into it and staring at it uh, Cause I've done a couple movie scores, not at your level, but you know, lower levels, but I kind of do the same thing. I'll look at the scene, I'll loop it, kind of in, indulge myself in it, go into it. Then I'll go into my own memory bank and try to pull out sounds. And, and also, like you said, you're taking the sounds that you heard from that and, and putting it on your, your turntable. And that, that's, that's, that's genius, man. I, I really appreciate hearing that. And, and, and yeah, and, scratch the dialogue back into the film. Right. Yeah, and I, I I remember hearing that. Yeah, because I I watched it uh, again uh, two days ago just to kind of uh, refresh my mind. But um, yeah, that's that's and like I was telling you, I'm I'm a huge when it comes to producers, um, you know, I'm a huge West Coast hip hop fan. Um, you know, like you know, like I said, Dre and Quick is my favorite producer of all time. I don't know, have you ever worked with DJ Quick? No, no, I actually met him once in in at the Nam show in Los Angeles. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been to the NAM uh, in Tennessee before. 
Um, but I haven't been to the one in L.A. Uh, and then now we're not doing them now because there's all this COVID stuff going on. Yeah, they, they did it virtually this year and I missed it. But I'm normally there every year. Really? OK. Yeah, I'm at the NAMM show every year. OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been going every year for the last 15, 20 years. Man. OK, so <laughs> here's some of my auto engineering questions. Uh, do you have a favorite vocal chain? Um, Neve, LA two A, forty seven. Wow. Okay. Um, Avalon, forty seven. Right. <laughs> um, I just got hip to. Well, I had 9098 to uh, LA, not LA 2A, but the, um, which one is that? The 100, the LA 100. Okay, right, right. Um, that's the, That was the Whitney Houston setup. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. 9098 LA 2A. Okay. Not the LA 2A, the LA 100. Right, I got you, I got you. I forgot the brand. What brand is that again? Um, Teletronics. Man. Is it Teletronics? It, not Teletronics, but one of those. Yeah. Um, and I have one just in the other room. I, I would go run and get it and read what it says. Right. Because um, I think Indigo Studios uh, out in California has has a couple of those, I think. Yeah. And you're talking audio vocal paths, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, these, uh, so I have several. I, I mean, I have a uh, what is that? The um, the the focus right. Uh, what's the name? The eight channel uh, mic pre. Um, people are sleeping on that. Is it red? No, the blue one. Blue one. I don't know about that one. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Oh, sleeper. Oh. Okay. And uh, people are starting to catch on. If you go online now, the price is going up because people are real figuring it out. Like, wow, that it, it's supposedly it was designed quietly by Rupert Neve when he was in between starting his new company. He did the Amec and then he went to Focus Right. Right. Well, he made a good one over there. Right. Uh, it's a channel. It's it's pricey, but it's you got eight channels of it. Of right. Basically, Rupert Neve, Mike Priest. Also, uh, I, um, so I, I have one of those also. So I go through that. Um, and um, DBX 160. Okay. Just the basics. Great compressor. Great compressor. Yeah. I had a bunch of those. I, I think I have one, and I, I, I always make sure I keep one of, some, of whatever it is. Right. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. You know, those those particular paths is what I can do like myself. You know, I don't need to go to a studio nowhere to do that. I have those paths. Right. And so yeah, I'm only telling you what I, I actually can do. You know? Right. Um, those are my favorites because I can do them. <laughs> right. So yeah, I don't know if you can see in the background. It's one of my mics. It's the uh, blue kiwi back there. Uh, so it's like a, yeah, it's like, it. a, it's like a with the green. Yes, yes, yeah, the Kiwi, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a, uh, it's well, it's it's not like an eighty-seven, but it it, it 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 it's up to par there, you know. Um, the next mic I do want to get is a Neumann Fet uh, forty-seven. Fet forty-seven. Yes, yes. It's the short one. Yes, yes. So that's yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the next one I want to get. I have I have the forty-seven, but uh, need to get it repaired. And uh, Sennheiser um, was telling me about the, the the capsules i have to be careful mm -hmm. with that because they'll replace it with a capsule that that's not changes the sound completely and so there's a guy that they're waiting to get a hold of that is the expert in that it's one guy left that that, that can correct fix those correctly i mean that's the way they made it sound i don't know how true that is but that's right. basically the way they made it sound um but um I want a, I want a new U87. I want a new one. Okay. You know, buy a brand new one. They put it about three thirty five hundred now. So right, like right. So yeah, I just want to get a new one of those. I always love the sound of those. Nothing sounds like the 47s, man. That's that's just 
you know, the Sony and the 47, those are the two best sounding mics I've, I've ever used. Right. You know, but the 87 is, was a great all around anybody coming in. And even the 67, you ever hear a 67? I've heard it one time and I was great, sound, I was, great sounding mic. And it was the vintage version. It wasn't a new version. And I, I was no, like, no, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine has a vintage version. Yes. Kept yeah. it in mint condition. Sounds wow. awesome. Yeah, like once I um, <laughs> once I get the money, I want flowing out. That, that will definitely be one of the mics I'm getting because I want to say this as an auto engineer. That's a mic you need. You know, we have this software and these. Uh, Which mic are you talking about? It's 67. Yeah, it's a great mic. And, you know, it's supposedly it's a female's mic. I don't agree with that. It's a great mic. Right. Right. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. It costs you 20,000 for the, the real vintage one. Uh, Rex, are you there? Can you hear us? I don't think he's there yet, but um, yeah, and also like I was telling you, uh, DXT, I'm, 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 I mean, you know, it's cool having this in the box things. What I do like is, and personally, um, because this is what I missed out in school when I went to school for auto engineering, I didn't get to use the you know tape machines and put stuff on tape. You know, Pro Tools is convenient, it's fast, but I just want to know that process of how to cut tape and you know, splicing and just the sound because I have these emulation plugins and all that, but man, listen, man, you don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah. Great. The sound, man. But I, I remember doing those mo edits, man. It's this, it's, it's, it's a horrible experience, man. <laughs> Cause if you mess up, you messed up. Right. Right. There's no going back. Right. You know? And so, the fact that, um, I mean, sonically, you know, I have a 827, I have an 800 Mark II. Right. I think I have a, it's a Mark V. I, I forgot, I forgot what Mark it is, but I know it's a Mark something. Right. Um, uh, and you can still go through the electronics and, and pick up some of that warmth of the electronics into your digital path. You know, a right. lot of people do that. A lot of people, connect their pro tools to their two inch machine right you know um but i have the, the neve boxes so i don't i don't do it because i have i i um some through neve and plus you're saying the dangerous transformer gives you that um and the dangerous gives you that you yeah, know yeah but um hey can you guys hear me yes we can hear you now hey check this out real quick see you guys see this is too much because both of y'all connecting on that technical shit <laughs> Let me ask you this. No, because see, I, I can't take both of y'all because both of y'all talking that space age to Jimmy Castor. <laughs> <laughs> talking about the next wire and shit. <laughs> hey, okay, D, let me ask you this, bro. Yes, sir. Herbie Hancock, 19, what year? 1985? Uh, you won the Grammy? 83. Was it 83? Yeah. Wow. Yeesh. Yikes. So after that, man, uh, how was life after that? I mean, uh, uh, it was it was very interesting. It, it's um, it's a, it's a bittersweet thing when you have a mega hit record. It it your life changes, and some of the, some of it is good, and some of it is things that you'd rather not do again. You know, and it's a weird experience. You know, in most cases, you don't see the impact of the song in your neighborhood if you know by the time you get off the, by the time you come back from tour speaking of neighborhood i'm glad you took it there when you had that hit how did how did people i can't i can't hear words you're saying bro when you had that hit how did people feel about you because you know you're talking about the the you're talking about the 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 Rex, can you hear us? Obama phone. You Rex, I think you dropped out again. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 um, you know, not to keep beating this drum, but I'm just, I'm just an analog dude. I, 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 I again, I have Pro Tools. I, you know, I have, you know, I, I, I just, I'm tired of plugins. You know, I really am tired of plugins. When ever since when I went to school, and then when I went to Real Studios. And I actually touched real gear. I was like, what's the point of this stuff? I'm, I, I get it's more affordable, less space. You're not le using as much electricity. There's an upkeep and stuff like that. But when I heard sonically the difference between a plug-in versus the real thing, I was like, 
This is stupid, in my opinion, because I, I just. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I felt the same way, and but now they have dialed in. You right. Know, some of those plugins are are, are, are just as good uh, as some of the hardware. Some, and some do things that the hardware won't do. You right. Know? And so it, it's, you know. It's it, it's it's based on whatever your application is, and what sounds you're trying to get. You know, if you want vintage sounding things, then you know what you have to do. Uh, you know what you need. Right. You have to get vintage gear. Um, if you want vent, vintage sounding like stuff, <laughs> you know. You have that. You can. You have a guarantee of getting that out of your plugins. I, I think, I would say the reverb plugins nowadays, especially from UA, I think they're up to par with a lot of these hardware, uh, uh reverb plugin. I mean, um, har- hardware uh, gear. But in terms of the compressors, the EQs, in my opinion, they're just they're not there. But the reverbs, they're pretty darn close. Um, oh, the Sonic stuff is good. You said it's called Sonic? Sonics, yeah. It's, okay. it is, it's one of the rare plugins. It's not easy to come by. Yeah, I never even heard of it. That's why. <laughs> it used to be it used to be Sony. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Sony's plugins. Got it. Got it. And those are really good. Um uh, mm-hmm. and, and Wayne's got some great stuff too. You got to know which ones to deal with, but they got some great stuff. I mean, they all do. They all have, all of the companies have, some of their stuff is great and some of it, it is what it is. It's up to you, of how you, your tweaking skills, you know. Right, right, right. And, and your approach. And then the stuff on Plugin Alliance is good. I don't know if you like their stuff too, but they have. Plugin Alliance is, yeah. is good too. I mean, I use the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the mastering plugin, the big one. Oh, that's made by them. Yeah, it's it's uh it's black. Um, yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, I know yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got they that. They have the legacy version, and they have that. Yeah, the one that does its the sub summing and all that. Right. I think I got them on sale for one day for like thirty nine uh ninety uh thirty nine dollars because they had this coupon. So I was like, I'm getting that. Uh, Rex, are you there? Can you hear us? Because you're back in the room. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. We can barely, but we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, D. D. Yes, sir. You were yes, sir. you you were talking of you were talking about the bittersweet part. Uh, like after like after the Grammy, like in, in your years of being yourself in your twenties, between the years of like what eight nineteen eighty four to nineteen eighty eight, what was going on with you mentally and musically? Um, and I got on a plane, man, and didn't get off. I got on a tour bus, and didn't get off. And it was just, it was travel and travel and travel and travel. Mm. Country to country to country to country. You know, sweatsuits and boots from Roots. <laughs> it was just insane. And by the time you get back home, you know, the record's two and three years old. So it's just a weird experience, you know? Um, and then, you know, people are pulling at you from every which way, you know? You um, you have all these opportunities, people are coming at you with all kinds of opportunities, trying to get you to be part of, you know, entice, trying to entice you to be part of whatever ideas they have. And some of them are great ideas, and, you know? It's, it's that world that you have to make a decision on whether you really want to do that or not and how far you want to go in that world where people are pulling at you from every, everywhere hey, and, hey, and, make, hey, and making assumptions about you that you, you don't understand how they get come to that conclusion. Hey, but let me ask you this though. Uh, along with that, with your music and the uh, transformation in the music, because what's so mm-hmm. about transformation, man? You talk about transformation and music. There's also transformation in rap and hip hop. How do you stay consistent 
And you know, because you're really like, like you're, you're a turntable listener, you're, you're a jazz artist, you're a professor, you're a scientist. How did you stay consistent in the transformation and everything changing? Um, you know, it 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 it, it comes from how you how, how you are, are groomed to begin with. It, it, yeah, to begin it, with, it comes with the path that you're on at the beginning. Okay. If you start with a corner, you're going to end up with a square, you know. And so, if you start where you the, the forward progress is ingrained and you're nurtured in a way where you keep reaching, and you you see that that's the mechanism of forward progress is taking those steps, and you move forward, then you'll use that. Um, that technique to uh, for your forward progress, and and um, you know I, I grew up in a way where I was around a bunch of musicians, and I I saw them practicing and and getting better and better. I wanted to do the same thing, so um, you know I just do what I need to do to move forward. You know I'm not perfect, so I, I hit I hit brick walls sometimes, bumps, potholes, you know, but uh, I navigate my way out of them to get back on track at, you know, every time I do that. I know that that's, that's part of, you know, living and the, and the experience of life, those things will come and in them are lessons that um, improve who you are in most cases, if you recognize what the issue is, that helps you move forward and better. Well, you know, I'm going to say this to anybody that is watching this, to anyone that is watching this, this guy is an example of travel. He's an example of travel. There's nothing like travel. I know Chris Rock used to talk about that in one of his comedy acts a long time ago. About when you travel, man, you know, especially when you travel within the music, when you travel within the creativity of what you're doing. And I'm going to tell you, man, you know what? I'm listening to you talk and how you operate. You are truly on another level, brother. I mean, you are true. I mean, with this corona, because keep in mind, like I tell people on a lot of videos, we are now living the rude awakening. And we are now living a mind blow. And I would tell you, man, uh, this corona, this virus, has definitely brought out something different in many ways, on many levels, whether it's good or bad. And I would tell you, man, um, if 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 you have the natural gift, your services are needed right now. If you have a natural gift of talent, your services are needed right now. Because I'm going to tell you, like I tell people, from a pile of shit, flowers arise, and we are the flowers. So with that in mind, what projects are you doing now? And I'm going to tell you right now, too, Dave, if there was another creation of Earth, Wind, and Fire and another reinvention of these groups, you'd be the guy to do it. If that was a, a new young earth been in mind, you put some Spanish brothers in there, you make it multicultural and make it like a new star earth been in fire and bring your and bring your twist to it. Nothing another earth one, nothing nothing earth been in fire did. I ain't talking about no remake, but like another a continuation of that kind of group. Because you're totally jazz. You're a jazz dude. And with your hip hop uh background. And everything you want me to DJ and the turntables and everything, you can put together some really monster stuff, man. Because I'm gonna tell you, your services is definitely needed. Because I really believe the way you operate as a human, your music can do some healing on this planet right now. Well, I agree. We definitely need uh, some uplifting, especially in the young, the young people, in regards to their understanding of, you know disseminating positive energy into the community. Um, we're in trouble in that area, big time. Hey, you know what, you know what's really a shame, though? Like I was speaking what? 
Rex, can you hear me? I was about to say, I'm having trouble hearing him. Rex, are you, can you get closer to your laptop? I don't think that's going to fix it. Can you hear me? I can hear you a little better. That's, that's, that's a little better. Yeah. If you can stay back, I'm just saying because it's, it's out of phase. If you can get as close as you can uh, with the signal. Hey, we're, we're, we're at, a, we're at a 11 o'clock. Yeah, it is, it is kind of time to wind down now. Um, but I'd like to continue this where I can be seen also. So we do a part two uh, maybe, in next, next, maybe next month. This way I can show some albums and stuff. I really want to have a nice talk with Dave about a lot of stuff. Well, about, I was just making, I was just pointing that out that we're, we're, we're timely. No, but, you know, but, uh, but I'd like to continue this but I want to be seen and talk to you also. Well, it, Ask the brother if he if he has more questions. Well, I'll, I'll leave for one more because uh, I'll close it out in a bit. But my last question is: uh, When you're producing uh, DXT, um, what um, programs are you using? Are you using Ableton, uh, Native Instruments? What are you using? It it depends on the applicant. It depends on the project. You know, sometimes there's none of that stuff. You know, sometimes it's just Pro Tools, put it in record, and and uh, you know, everyone's playing. You know, right. um, uh, if it's a if it's a track that's all samples and stuff, then you use the drum machines and samples. Right. Uh, the records that I'm the records I'm about to do now, it's all musicians. So I'm just tracking oh, like this. Yeah. Excuse me. Who would you like to work with now? I'm not understanding what you're saying. Who would you like to work with now? Well, it's not who I would like to work with. It's who I'm going to work with now. I'm, I have a band that I'm putting together right now. And it's a session band and it's an all-star band. Um, uh, Will Calhoun from Living Color is the drummer. Um, Doug Wimbish is also part of this this concept that we're putting together. Bernard Fowler from the Rocket Band, and he's also from the Rolling Stones. Yeah, he's still with the Stones. Right. Uh, Mike Hampton, Parliament Funkadelic is in the band. Uh, Victoria Theodore, who played with Stevie Wonder and Beyonce. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. I'm still putting this band together. Right on. Um, okay. that's, that's gonna be great. Oh yeah, it's a serious band. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, Rex, um, like I said, we, we we might do a part two on this um, because. Oh, yeah, I'm good for that. Yeah, it's just some technical things. We're doing on my.